All right, everybody, let's get this show started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It's good to be with you for another edition of our program. My name is Chris Smith. I'm the coordinator for current science programs here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I'll be your host for today's show, as I normally typically am. And uh, this is one of my favorite programs to run. We get to meet really interesting people who are doing fascinating and interesting work out there in the worlds of science, nature, uh, technology, education, conservation, and more. And of course, obviously today, we're going to have a good time as well. Now, the Lunchtime Discovery Series is also brought to you by the folks at the Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality within the state of North Carolina. Uh, their offices are actually like just across the street from mine. They're literally like just over there behind me on the other side of this wall. We'll have a couple other walls. But uh, many thanks to them for working to bring today's guest to us and all of our guests. And then, of course, always, I don't say this enough, but many thanks to the digital media team here at the museum who do a great job of getting this program out to you every single week. So, you know, big round of applause for everybody that comes together to make this happen across government agencies. I know. Can you believe it? Anyway, we make it happen for all of you and glad to do it. Uh, for today's program, I'm very excited. We're going to be hearing from someone very special. Uh, I don't know if I could actually say this, but I'm going to a friend of the show because the naturalist for the National Wildlife Federation is here, David Mizajewski. And this is not his first appearance on the Lunchtime Discovery Series. I think it's David's third. Hi, David. Welcome to the show. Hey, Chris. I am so excited to be back. Um, I'm sad I can't be there in person because the museum's amphitheater where you guys have your speakers is probably one of the best places that I've ever spoken. Such a cool atmosphere. But, you know, in these modern times, Zoom will have to do. You know what? Well, I love this because it means that you know, we get to take advantage of your expertise and your knowledge uh, to bring it to everybody in North Carolina, including people who aren't downtown Raleigh and inside the theater. So I, I think this is fabulous and this is great. Although I, I appreciate you saying uh, good things about the Daily Planet Theater, but I don't know if it compares to like being on TV with Conan O'Brien and Drew Barrymore. <laughs> Um, you know what? It's it's different for sure. But, you know, I love doing it all. And, you know, um, as a naturalist, my job is to interpret nature and wildlife and hopefully do it in a way that gets people excited about it. And um, quite honestly, I don't care what venue I'm in, because really it's about reaching as many people as possible. So whether I'm in a in a theater like yours or I'm on TV, um, it's all good stuff. And yeah, hopefully today um, that will be the experience of everybody watching. They'll learn something new and want to get involved in protecting the natural world. Agree 100%. And for all our viewers, I'll remind you, you can use the chat there on YouTube to log your questions, comments, experiences as well as we go through the program. I'll be looking to you to ask David questions. So make sure that as they pop into your brain, you put them into the chat. That way we can have a great conversation after the program. And with that, David, I'm excited for your presentation today. I'll turn it over to you. All right, excellent. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. I've got a whole bunch of slides that are part of the inspiration here. So hopefully um, you'll enjoy the photos that I've got going on. So bear with me for one second here while we do the little switcheroo. All right. So there we go. Thumbs up from Chris. That means everybody can see. So I'm going to minimize myself here so I don't have to look at myself and I'm going to dive right into it. So my talk today is called Wildlife Movements and Migration. And this is actually I, a little caveat, the second time I've given this talk. So a lot of this information, I actually had a research and it's new to me. So I do have some notes in front of me. So if I glance down, I'm just making sure I get all my numbers and my stats right um, until I really kind of get this, this entire talk memorized. But let's see, why is that not working? There we go. So. You all just heard a little bit about me and what I do. Um, again, I'm a naturalist with the National Wild, and my job every day is to, like I said a moment ago, to interpret the natural world and hopefully get you all inspired to get involved in conservation. I do wanna uh, start just by telling you a little bit about the National Wildlife Federation. We're one of the oldest and largest wildlife conservation and, and education organizations. We're a nonprofit and 
we focus our work largely on North America. That's one of the things that sets us apart from a lot of our sister conservation organizations that are working, you know, more globally on and on wildlife conservation in you know all other parts of the world. But this is our mission: it's to unite all Americans to ensure that wildlife and people thrive in our rapidly changing world. It's no secret that we human beings are the cause of most of that rapid change which is impacting wildlife populations and it's impacting us too. And one of our really core beliefs at the National Wildlife Federation is when we save wildlife, we save ourselves. We're really connected. And, and it's, it's, you know, both of those are really critically important parts of our mission. So we do that work in a whole wide variety of ways from, you know, fighting for good policy and legislation back in Washington, DC to building the largest highway overpass out in California for wildlife, to reintroducing bison to their native grasslands habitat um, in North America. And of course, in North Carolina, our state affiliate, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, is doing all sorts of great work, including work on the critically endangered red wolf. We also publish Ranger Rick magazine. I don't know if any of you, any of you read that as a kid. I did served me well. Uh, we have a great program called Garden for Wildlife that's all about restoring habitat right where you live by planting native plants. So if you're interested in any of that, I do encourage you to you know, head to our website, nwf.org, or just Google National Wildlife Federation, and you can get involved. All right, let's get into migration. So, you know, I want to start by just kind of explaining what is migration. Um, so migration is movement that wildlife species do across the landscape. And there's a few different kind of reasons why wildlife might migrate. The most obvious that I think we all think of is seasonal migration. You know, certain species want to escape, you know, the cold weather or depending on the parts of the country or the world, they might be, you know, escaping the hot season, the dry season, that kind of thing. Um, and that's largely about food resources and also just being able to survive the elements. But wildlife also move across the landscape and migrate for food, uh, for uh, breeding purposes, as well as, as, you know, just being able to find a meal during those, those winter months. And so there's, a, you know, there's a kind of a few different reasons why an animal might move. And some of these migrations are, you know, massive long distance migrations, and some of them are, are shorter, and maybe are sort of like migration with a lowercase m, if you will. And so the species that I'm going to talk to you about today um, some of them do these long distance migrations. Some of them do more local or regionalized. Um, and so um, I've got the whooping crane up here and, the, you know, birds are sort of the classic example of, of migrators. So are monarch butterflies. And you might know that the, the monarch butterfly is in real trouble. It's, it's really starting to disappear um, and so, again, the National Wildlife Federation is doing a whole bunch of work. In fact, this week um, we're, we're hosting something called the Monarch Blitz. Um, again, you can Google that if you want to get involved and report your monarch sightings um, this week. It's kind of a, a way to help uh, conservationists and scientists track their movements. But I am not going to be talking about these usual migratory suspects, migratory birds or migratory butterflies, because you know what? There's a lot that has been said about these groups of wildlife migrating, and I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the species that you might not think of as my migratory species or that really just don't get a lot of attention for their migrations. And so with that, we're going to dive into one of my favorite groups of wildlife, bats. Now, bats are awesome. Um, they are mammals. Um, they are not rodents. They're one of the most diverse groups of mammals. There's something like 1400 species of bats. They're the second most diverse group of mammals um, after rodents. And um, they're very, very diverse. In the US, we've got uh, 47 species and the majority of them are insect eaters, but some of them feed on other things. I'm gonna talk about that. But um, they're really awesome animals, really super beneficial. And so let's talk about some of their ecology and you know why bats or how bats might migrate. So as the only truly flying mammal, bats have the ability like birds or like those monarch butterflies to travel long distances because they can fly. And that's always a benefit when you're moving across the landscape, you know, either just sort of on your nightly foraging or you know for these seasonal migrations. Um, so some bats are roosting in the trees, like this northern long-eared bat that you see here hanging onto the tree bark. Um, other bats are roosting in caves. And by roosting, I mean, that's where they hang out during the day. But it's also 
in reference to what what they do during sort of the cold months or you know when they you know sort of their destinations where they migrate and so some bats are actually hibernating so they will go into you know oftentimes um, it's the cave roosting bats that are going to be be the hibernators and they'll go into um you know th these these safe spaces and they'll sort of enter this sort of slow period for the winter um because most of our bat species as i mentioned are feeding on insects and in cold you know winter seasons insects also go dormant or disappear or in some cases migrate as we're going to talk about and so the bats have nothing to eat so one of their strategies is to is to hibernate but some of them do migrate south, again, just like birds might do, to go to places where it doesn't get that cold and the insect and invertebrate life is still really active, thus giving them something to eat. And some bats kind of do a little bit of both. So some bat species, um, they are migrating, but not to sort of stay active all winter. They're actually migrating to their hibernacula, which is one of the coolest words in the English language. This is basically uh this, this spot where they're gonna where, where they're gonna hibernate and so you know some bat species again will will just migrate a long distance in order to get to say the cave where their species congregates for hibernation um and so uh let's get into some of these migratory bats so this is the retailed bat and you can see why it gets that that name you can see that long tail sticking out out of the back these are one of the most numerous bats that we have they're found in the summer months across like the southern tier of the us um and they are a colonial species and there again are a lot of them it's estimated that um some of their in some of their roosting caves there can be as many as 1800 bats per square meter Think about that. That's a, an enormous amount of biomass. Um, and so the um, one of the, the most famous places where the Mexican free-tailed bat roosts is the Bracken Cave Maternal Colony in San Antonio, Texas. And it's estimated there's approximately 20 million bats in that um, in that particular bat colony. And, you know, they're there right now because it is the summer months, which is when they're up here in the U.S. So a lot of bats. It's a, you know, a, a kind of a, a an amazing thing to even think about that that number of any individual creatures, especially a vertebrate, you know, maybe insects we think of as swarming. But these are, you know, incredibly dense populations of these bats. Now, Mexican free-tailed bats are insect eaters. So again, I've already mentioned it a couple of times. The majority of our 47 species of bats found in, in North America are insect eaters. And because there are so many of them, particularly in the Bracken Cave ecosystem, um, it's estimated that they can consume in any one night 220, uh, 220 tons of insects per night. That's about the equivalent of 55 elephants. So I just wanted to share all that because I think it's mind blowing. It's not really to do necessarily with their migration, but um, but this species of bat, again, will um, migrate south during the winter and they're gonna be going down to, to Mexico and they'll stay active and they'll be feeding all winter. And again, this photo here is showing the the, the Mexican free-tailed bats emerging you know, in the evening. And it just really gives you a sense of the incredible densities of these animals. They're also, considered the fastest flying mammal, which really they're only competing with other bats, but they can, they've been clocked at going uh, 99.5 miles per hour in horizontal flight. So that's just, again, mind blowing. So I wanted to share that. And on average, they are migrating much slower than that. It's only about 13 miles per hour, per hour but still they're almost going hundred miles an hour. It's a, a wonder that any insect can escape them. So, you know, again, you can see the densities of this particular species of bat. Check this out. This is uh, a weather radar map from Texas. And um, there are so many from, and it's particularly from the Austin area. Um, another place where these bats are found are um, in Austin. And there's the famous bridge there where the, the, the you know, the, the flocks of bats and the swarms of bats are leaving every night. And sometimes, especially when they are migrating, those swarms get so dense that they shut radar like this. It's just incredible. And of course, this particular species, 
because of this density and because they're migrating and they kind of, you know, they come out every night at sort of a regular time, then people can show up and observe this. It's one of the most awesome wildlife watching opportunities that we have here in the U.S. So if you haven't, I highly encourage you to go visit a place like Bracken Cave or like um, Austin, Texas, where you could see some of these swarms. It's really, really cool. All right, so the, the Mexican free-tailed bat is an insect eater, but as I mentioned, there are other food sources that certain species of bats, including those that are found here in North America, feed on. And as you can see from this picture, one of the main food sources for these other species are is flower nectar. Um, some species eat fruit or also eat fruit. So this is a lesser long-nosed bat. This is one of the three species of nectar feeding bats that are found in North America, or I should say in the US. Um, the other two are the greater long-nosed bat, also called the Mexican long-nosed bat, and the Mexican long-tongued bat. And these bats, as you can see, are have a very kind of different um, face structure than a lot of the insect eating bats, which tend to have a little bit of a flatter face. And, um, you know, they, they have these kind of weird configurations on their face, face, which helps with echolocation. But bats that feed on flower nectar or fruit, they don't really use echolocation because their food source isn't flitting around and they don't have to kind of hone in on it. So, um, and I love this photo of kind of the cross section of the, the cactus bloom here because it shows how effective these three particular bat species are as pollinators as well. And so um, these bats are found depending on the species. The Mexican long-tongued um, can be found in uh, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and sometimes Southern California. The, the Mexican or greater long-nosed bat is only found in Texas and New Mexico and is in fact an endangered species. And this bat that we're looking at right now, the lesser long nose, is only found in Arizona and New Mexico. And lest I be a Debbie Downer conservationist, I do want to point out that this bat has actually been delisted. It was once uh, listed as, uh, I think, an endangered. It might have been threatened. Um, but because of you know conservation efforts, it's actually recovered and it has been completely delisted. So we've got a nice little endangered species success story. But these bats will spend the winter months in Mexico and in Central America. And then in the summer months, when it's warm enough for them and the, the cactus and the agave and things like uh, those sort of desert plants that uh, whose blooms they feed on are, are blooming during those, those summer months, that's when they kind of migrate north. And, you know, if you live, you know, I know most folks watching are probably from North Carolina, but I, I believe anybody can join this. So, um, you know, you might be lucky enough if you live in some of those, those desert Southwest or Southern California um, areas to have this happen. Now we generally kind of have a rule in, in conservation. And I mentioned our garden for wildlife program earlier at the National Wildlife Federation, where it's all about helping people restore habitat and attract you know, birds and butterflies by providing them with natural food sources. We really kind of emphasize like don't feed the wildlife, like don't put out you know cat food or scraps or whatever. Um, one of the exceptions to the rules of don't not not to feed wildlife, um, you know, beyond birds with a bird feeder. Um, specifically, we talk a lot about not feeding mammals like bears or raccoons or whatever. Um, one of the exceptions is is bats in this area, because sometimes this will happen. They'll visit these hummingbird feeders to drink up that sugar water nectar that the hummingbirds love, because, again, it's just like the flower nectar that they naturally feed on. So really, really cool wildlife watching opportunity. So we've talked about the Mexican uh, free-tailed bat. We've talked about um, the three species of nectar feeding bats. Another awesome bat species, this one happens to be one of my favorites, is called the Eastern Red Bat. Now just look at the face of this animal. How could you not think it's amazing and really cool? Um, this bat is not only cute and not only kind of uniquely colored with that sort of rusty orange red fur, but it's also one of the... Um, I might even be the only bat that I know of anyway, maybe in other parts of the world, um, that is both migratory and hibernates. But the thing that's unique about it is where it hibernates. And I'm going to tell you about that in a second. But this is a bat that ranges sort of the eastern half of the U.S., like eastern, uh, all the way up to the Rocky Mountains. And, you know, it goes all the way up into Canada and all the way down south. And so, again, this is one of those bats that the southern populations probably are going to stay Kind of where they are. Um, the northern populations are probably going to be migrating south 
because they just can't really survive those extreme cold temperatures. But as you all know, in, in North Carolina, it can still get cold in the South. So this particular bat has a very unique strategy for surviving that. It goes into a hibernation um, or a winter torpor is more scientific. Um, but what this bat does is when the temperatures drop into sub-freezing, the sub-freezing zone, it normally will kind of roost in trees through the winter and just sort of kind of stay dormant. But when the temperatures get that cold, they're they're still there's you know they're exposed when they're up in the trees. So what this bat species does is that it goes down to the ground and buries itself in the leaf layer that's found or should be found in our natural sort of woodland ecosystems. And some of the adaptations that it has in order to do that are that thick fur. And you can see even like the, 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 the back end of it, that skin flap is called a patagium. Um, in most bats, it's not fur, but in this species it is. And you can see it's kind of folded itself in half and that furry patagium helps actually retain some body moisture. Um, and I know I keep going back to this sort of, sort of garden for wildlife thing. One of our messages with that is to try to keep your fallen leaves where they fall or at least on your property and create that natural leaf layer because it's really important habitat for all sorts of wildlife, everything from moths and butterflies that many species overwinter in that leaf layer to our data bees, to birds that forage there. And now you can add a bat to the list because without that you know, sort of naturally thick leaf layer, these bats have nowhere to hibernate. And so um, I just think it's this is like one of the coolest things. I remember years ago discovering that these bats do it. And it's just, it's kind of blows my mind every time. So let's move on to how bats navigate when they are migrating. So we mentioned echolocation a second ago, and they bats actually don't use echolocation. That's pretty specifically um, an adaptation for finding prey and obviously sort of navigating around the landscape. But they really don't use it when they do these sort of greater migrations across the landscape. So some bats, like birds, are able to you know sort of perceive the Earth's magnetic fields, and they're able to navigate that way. Um, some bats, it's you know, research has shown, are actually following visual cues in the landscape, and there's it's suggested that this might actually be learned behavior. So you know, sort of young bats are are migrating with their swarm or following other bats, and they're kind of learning those visual cues in the landscape so they can get to point A to point B every year. And I think that's really fascinating too. And similarly, some bats, um, there's evidence that they're actually following the actual calls of other bats as they're doing those migrations. So um, it's it's pretty fascinating behavior. Um, again, especially for a small animal. I mean, most of our, our bat species, our North American bat species are pretty tiny. And I always marvel at the idea that, um, you know, these small songbirds and these tiny bats, and again, monarch butterflies can travel such long distances. Um, it's, it's, again, just sort of a really neat natural phenomenon that is happening all around us here in the U.S. So, of course, um, as a conservationist, I have to just also note some of the threats that these species are facing. Um, habitat loss in general is something that is impacting migratory bats. You know, if their habitat at either end of their migration is disturbed or eliminated by human activity, that's a bad thing. Light pollution is a big problem. I mean, bats are migrating at night. And again, particularly for species that might be following visual cues, light pollution from our cities and our towns um, could be a big issue. So, you know, remember to try to minimize your, your outdoor lighting and that not only will help the bats, but also the, all the other migratory species like birds that, you know, many of which are migrating at night too. Wind turbines are a big issue. Um, you know, clean energy is really important. Um, and certainly wind turbines are a much better um, source of fuel, you know, electric electricity generating um, energy for us than, you know, continued reliance on fossil fuels. But, you know, they can actually do a number on bats. There's some evidence that shows that bats are kind of kind of drawn to them and they don't actually get hit by them, but it it's like the wind, um, the, the strength of the wind actually impacts them and can actually injure them and even kill them. So that's an issue, but the good news is, is that there is research going on and figuring out how, um, how to protect bats and birds and other migratory wildlife from those wind turbines. So um, that work continues. And the overarching problem that we face, again, is that climate change, which is fueled by our use of fossil fuels. And that's impacting not only migratory bats, but all sorts of other wildlife. Oh, and actually that species that I was just showing you, let me see if I can quickly go back. This is a hoary bat. Um, and um, this bat in particular is impacted by those wind turbines. Um, I'm just gonna check my notes here to get this right. But 
um, it's estimated that collision with these or or sort of impact from the the strong winds that these wind turbines create um, actually can kill uh, or it accounts for 38 percent of the total yearly deaths in the species. So again, that work to figure out wildly friendly wind turbines is really important. All right, so let's move on to our next species of migratory wildlife, manatees. You know, most of us, again, automatically think of flying wildlife as migratory. You know, maybe we think about terrestrial wildlife that are moving, you know, across the landscape, you know, herds of, of elk or pronghorn or things like that, um, or wildebeest or whatever, if you're talking about other parts of the world. But, um, but manatees are actually engaging in a seasonal migration as well. So um, let's talk a little bit about manatees. So their technical species name is the West Indian manatee. Uh, and that's because they range this, as a species in the Caribbean, in, in sort of Florida and across our Southern coasts here, um, and even in the Gulf Coast uh, at the Northern end of South America and the, and the Atlantic coast of South America. Um, so there are two subspecies though. And the one that we have here in the US is called the Florida manatee. The other one is the Antillean manatee, and that's the one that's found in the Caribbean. Again, same species, West Indian manatee, but kind of subspecies. So, um, so we're going to be talking about the Florida manatee. Now, these are um, fully aquatic herbivores that are found both in fresh and saltwater ecosystems, and um, they again, they're 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 mammals, so they're they have lungs, they're breathing air, and um, they. Um, I already said that they can move between fresh and salt water. So here's the thing with manatees. They are actually very sensitive to cold. They actually really can't survive in water that gets colder than 68 degrees. And that's really not all that cold. I mean, you've probably been swimming in, you know, water that's colder than that. Um, and and it might be a shock to your system when you first dive in. But, but and, and I... I People get confused by this because when you look at this animal and you think, you know, sort of a marine mammals, you know, we associate them with being able to tolerate, in many cases, cold, cold waters. And the, an adaptation for that typically are is a layer of blubber. And when you look at a manatee, you know, it's very easy to think, well, look how chubby and round they are. They must have blubber under there. But here's the thing. Manatees actually really don't have have that insulating layer of blubber. They have a really big digestive tract that takes up a lot of the bulk of that body. They also have a one inch thick skin. So that round shape is just, you know, they're sort of their natural shape. It actually, if you look at them front to back, they're very streamlined, helps them move through the water, but they don't have that insulating layer of blubber that you might see in sort of much more Northern species of mammals that are living in kind of marine ecosystems like a walrus or um, even some of our whales. So. Um, so what happens is when these manatees are exposed to water that gets colder than 68 degrees is that they can suffer what's called cold stress sy uh, syndrome. And I won't get into all of the, you know, the, the metabolic processes that happen there, but it can cause blood, blood clots, essentially, and it can ultimately lead to organ failure and death. So it's really important for manatees to stick around in, in warm waters, otherwise they can't survive. And this is what's behind their migrations. So here's a neat map that shows where the Florida manatee is found and where it goes during its migration. So if you look at Florida, you can see the, that dotted line. Like that is the year round habitat for manatees. Now in the summer months, when it warms up and the water temperatures beyond that sort of Florida, you know, kind of tropical or subtropical zone, um, when the waters warm up further north, the manatees you know, their available habitat expands. And so they will go up the East Coast. And, you know, I don't know if anybody in North Carolina has ever spotted one, but it is a possibility, you know, that it's not unheard of, even though it is relatively uncommon. And manatees have been observed all the way up off the coast of, of Massachusetts, off Cape Cod. So, you know, that's that's a pretty impressive journey. Now, of course, that can be dangerous for them if they don't turn around and get back to warm waters before kind of the cold weather sets in. Um, in the Gulf Coast, they've been spotted as far west as Texas. So, again, they're engaging in this in this sort of seasonal movement when that that seasonal change, again, expands their available habitat. But even within Florida, they have to migrate, you know, maybe smaller distances because 
like I said earlier in North Carolina, it gets cold in Florida too, particularly in the northern parts of the state. You know, there can very easily be, you know, freezing temperatures. And even if it's not freezing, certainly cold enough weather to get the water temperatures below 68 degrees. And so what more manatees are doing um, is not that sort of expanding migration, but what they're doing is migrating to warm water refugia, um, refuges of warm water, in other words, that are found in within sort of the coastal areas of, of Florida. And so there are natural springs that have warm water that's sort of heated geothermal heating that will you know kind of pour out and manatees have evolved to be able to take advantage of these of these natural warm water areas and they will congregate as you can see in this picture this is the uh, crystal river and there's a natural spring there that you know manatees have historically used and um, again just like with the bats it's always amazing when you see these uh, you know, these conglomerations of, of wildlife, um, I think anyway. So, um, and this this particular spring keeps the water between 72 and 74 degrees. So the manatees just, you know, it's the perfect spot for them to kind of hang out for the winter. But I love telling stories of wildlife adaptation because it is true, you know, nature isn't static. And um, in, in some cases, animals are actually able to benefit from the way that we humans have altered the environment. And usually that's not the case, but this is one of those cases where manatees have learned that they can take advantage of warm water effluent, like basically the, the, the wastewater that um, comes out of power plants. And the water isn't polluted or anything, it's just used to cool the power plant. And so the power plant emits heat, it warms the water, and then that gets released back out into the natural waterways. And manatees have figured, hey, I don't care if it's a natural spring, or if, it, if it's a human made warm water resource, we're gonna take advantage of it. And so there are power plants in Florida that manatees will also congregate at in the winter. And this one is, um, it's the Aquatic Research Center uh, at the US uh, Geological Survey. Um, and so um, again, kind of, a, kind of a neat story of coexistence with wildlife, I think. Um, so just like with bats, I want to touch on real quick, some of the migration threats that manatees face while they're moving across the landscape. So Boat strikes, I mean, this is something that manatees face pretty much all year round, but as they're moving and they're moving in places that maybe they're not, um, you know, in hanging out in the winter months where people know where they are, it can expose them to a little bit more risk. You know, as I mentioned, they're air breathers, they have lungs. So they have, they spend a lot of time floating at the surface uh, where their nostrils are on the tip of their nose and the top part, so they can just stick their nose up, but most of their body is submerged. And this photo really doesn't illustrate well how how invisible manatees can be in water that is a little bit uh, murkier than this. You know, they have this sort of gray body and it they literally can be invisible even if they're just below the surface of the water and only if their nose is sticking up. So boat strikes are a big issue. Um, for any kind of marine or aquatic wildlife entanglement in our fishing gear or our trash is always an ever present issue and threat. And as I also mentioned a minute ago, for ma manatees that migrate further north, you know, they can put themselves at risk of, of cold, the, the, the cold stress syndrome if they go too far north and don't know to turn around and come back to beat the oncoming winter months. And so that is something that happens and they can get, um, you know, cold stress that way. Other threats are extreme storms. Now, hurricanes are natural, um, they happen. Um, climate change is of course fueling more extreme weather, including hurricanes. And so this is a really dramatic image that we ran in National Wildlife Magazine a few years ago um, of a stranded manatee from um, just sort of incredible tidal changes that happen because of a hurricane. And luckily this individual was rescued and rehabilitated and I believe was released. So, um, so anyway, little success story there, but. Um, you know, it's a real threat and it's something that, you know, we humans, it's in our power to fix it, so or at least address it. Other things that can impact manatees during their migrations or during their sort of winter, um, their winter habitat is nutrient pollution. So when we put fertilizers on our lawns, on our agricultural areas, um, a lot of that can run off into the waterways and it it basically disrupts the natural cycle. And you think, oh, fertilizer in the water, that would be great, but it causes algae blooms, which then crash and suck all the oxygen out of the water. 
and it can actually kill the seagrasses that manatees need to survive on. Again, they're herbivores and their primary diet is seagrass. So that nutrient pollution, again, is a year round risk, but in particular, it can affect them at their warm water refugia. And in fact, um, there are there's definitely um, incidences of mass manatee die offs at their warm warm water winter refugia because of nutrient pollution. So in 2021, 450 manatees died in the Indian River Lagoon, um, which is one of their like prime year round, but they also use it in the winter months. Um, and so, uh, and then there were even ones that, you know, and they died because of starvation essentially, because there was nothing for them to eat. Um, this nutrient pollution can also cause red tide, which can kill manatees as well. So, um, you know, it, there's it's a big issue. And so, you know, just taking that message, you know, think globally, act locally, think about what you're putting on your yard, uh, minimize your lawn, don't use fertilizers, because this is an issue everywhere, not just in Florida. It's just that in Florida, it impacts manatees as well as the other wildlife. And of course, manatees are a threatened species. So anything we can do to help them out. So if you're a boater and you're boating in the manatee migration zone, you know, try to be follow the rules, no wake zones, um, be aware. Um, and again, think about how you're contributing to, you know, climate pollution and nutrient pollution into our waterways. And all of those things will help not only manatees, but all sorts of other aquatic and marine wildlife. All right, let's move on to our third group of migratory wildlife, dragonfly. So you know, we mentioned monarch butterflies their migration is pretty well understood. Not so much the case with the with dragonflies, but a little bit about dragonflies before we get into their, um, their migra migratory behavior. So they belong to the insect order Odonata, and that also includes the damselflies. And I just threw a little comparison slide up here because I, I feel like a lot of folks don't really know what the difference is. And if you think of butterflies and moths, one of the ways that you can tell the difference between those two related groups of insects is how they hold their wings. So butterflies hold their wings generally folded above their back when they are at rest, just like the insect on the right of the screen here, which is a damselfly. Just like moths, which tend to hold their wings flat, um, sort of perpendicular to their body and parallel to the ground when they're at rest, so do dragonflies. So you can see that really well illustrated here. Um, and of course, dragonflies tend to be much larger insects than damselflies, which are really tiny, delicate insects. So related, but different. So you've got 5,000 species of, of, uh, of dragonflies and, and damselflies in the world. And we've got 470 of those that are native to North America. There's one non-native um, dragonfly species that was introduced from Asia that we know of. There, there might be more, but, um, but we've got 470 species of these guys here in North America, which I think is really awesome. Um, so of those, like I said, dragonfly migration isn't well studied yet, but it's it, there's evidence that at least 18 of those 470 species of dragonflies are migratory. And again, just like bats, just like birds, just like the monarch butterfly, those wings give them uh, you know, a really uh, a powerful way to move long distances across the landscape. Also like the monarch butterfly, which migrates over multiple generations, some of these dragonfly species are doing the same thing. So the, the dragonflies that might be leaving um, northern areas not too far from now, because we're already in August. So migration, fall migration is already picking up for a lot of species. Um, some of these dragonfly species will take multiple generations to get to where they're going and back again in the spring. So the, the insects that left in the fall are not the same individuals that return. And that's actually, um, you know, really mind-blowing if you think about it. How do they do that? Um, and of course, insects being um, ectothermic animals or cold-blooded, you know, they can't regulate their body temperature. They've got to get away from the cold winter temperatures because they can't survive them. They'll, if they freeze, they die. Um, and dragonflies, you know, as adults, they don't have any adaptations. Some insects do to be able to, you know, overwinter in those cold environments. So they've got to um, have a strategy. And for some species, they move away. Um, others will, you know, sort of exist as larval in, in their aquatic phase underwater, you know, from over the winter. But these 18 species, they got to get out of Dodge in order to survive the winter. 
So let's talk about a few species that we know or believe to be migratory. The one that's most well known is the common green darner. These guys are found pretty much all across North America. They are big dragonflies. They can be like, like three inches or longer long. They've got this gorgeous green uh, torso and the beautiful sort of sky blue uh, um, abdomen there that you can see. Just really, really beautiful, beautiful insects. And um, the photo on the right, if you've ever seen this, what's happening here is, is well, it's dragonfly sex. I'll just say it bluntly. So, uh, but it, it's really cool, their behavior. So the males have these little claspers on the, the end of their abdomen that they actually will grab the female behind her head. And there's little divots in her head designed for those claspers to fit. And when she's ready to mate, she'll curl her abdomen up and you know they get their business done. Um, and it's kind of neat because it almost forms a heart shape. So if you were into kind of you know symbolism and and all of that, um, you know I think this is just an, an, a little little example of that where we can you know, have our human emotional interpretation of this natural phenomenon. So anyway, um, this is one of those migratory species that does it over multiple generations. They um, they can migrate on average over oh, almost 400 miles, um, but there are some individuals that have been documented that have gone 1,500 miles. Um, and these dragonflies are using kind of stopover sites during that migration. So they're not just going from point A to point B. In order to actually make it to their destination, they have to stop and kind of refuel in order to be able to have the, the calorie resources to complete that migration. And so generally they're gonna fly for a few days um, and on every third day, they're gonna need to stop and they're gonna need to rest and they're gonna need to feed. Um, and so um, that's an important consideration when we think about you know, kind of challenges that they might face and also you know, how we humans can make sure that they have habitat in order to be able to complete their migrations. Um, they, um, they don't really migrate the species when winds are really high. Um, you know, needs to be lower than 15 miles per hour, which really isn't that 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 strong of a wind. Um, and they actually, but they actually use the wind. They kind of will glide on the wind, and that helps them conserve energy so that they can make it further on. You know, with with a minimal of those sort of uh, stopover site needs. Um, so, here is a map of the green darner migration, and I'll just leave this up just for one second so you can get a quick glance of kind of where they're going and how far they might be going and kind of where to look for them in your neck of the woods. So, you know, I would say in, it looks like May, June, you know, through the summer, um, you know, but come in another month or so, um, you know, they're, they're not necessarily going to be around. So get them all you can. And it takes uh, at least three generations in order to be able to complete that migration for the green darner. Now I mentioned there's not a lot known about dragonfly migration because they're, relatively small animals. So how do you track them? Well, this is a really cool example of where science and, te and technology are coming into play in um, wildlife conservation. And so there have these tiny radio tags have been developed that are small and light enough that they can actually be attached to a dragonfly so that we can collect data on where these animals go. And it doesn't seem to have a negative impact on that. So I love that. I love the, uh, the idea of us using our you know, our scientific and, and technological uh, wizardry and applying it toward wildlife conservation. All right, our next species is the black saddlebag. And sidebar, dragonflies have the coolest common names, I think, of any group of wildlife. I mean, I mean, you can see why it's called black saddlebag, because it's got these markings on its wings, its hind wings, um, you know, that somebody at some point thought hey, they look like saddlebags that you'd have, you know, in the back of your horse there, I guess. But um, anyway, black saddlebags are another um, believed to be migratory species. This is also a species that's found across North America, but it's most common in the East. And it goes pretty far North. It'll go all the way up into um, Quebec and Ontario and British Columbia. And, the, um, and so um, it's also found in the West though. And so in the winter months, you can find it in places like Baja, California. It's been documented in Bermuda and Cuba in the winter as well, which means that they're likely you know, flying across open bodies of water. So one of the adaptations that this species has that helps in, in its migration are particularly wide wings. I mean, look at how wide those back wings are. Um, and so again, that's gonna help them with just, you know, sort of fuel efficiency, if you will, when they are traveling these long distances. Um, these, um, 
they're commonly seen in, in swarms with the green darner. Um, and so that's one of the indicators that they're also a migratory species. Um, the wandering glider is another species. Now this is a more tropical species um, and it will you know, migrate north and um, you know, found in Southern US, but mostly Florida is where it can be found. Um, and so they also have like kind of that, you know, extended broad hind wing that's gonna help them. And these guys are also doing it over successive generations. And they're, they're really um, dependent upon seasonal wetlands that form in the tropics. Um, you might be familiar with the concept of a vernal pool that we have up here in, in sort of the, the, the well, not the tropics, um, the, the north, but I include the southern U.S. Um, in that, where in the winter, you know, snow melts and it runs off and it forms, um, or, you know, winter rains even, um, the rainy season. It will form these seasonal ponds that dry out by the, you know, middle or the end of the summer, so fish can't live in them. So these dragonflies have evolved to be able to take advantage of similar kinds of seasonal bodies of water that are dependent on the rainy season in the tropics. So they're kind of migrating to get to those so that they can breed and their larvae can live in these fish-free ponds until they emerge as the winged adults. And so, um, that's kind of important when we come talk about some of the, the, the threats here. But um, these do use stronger winds in order to migrate. And there's actually been evidence of, again, sort of those uh, increasing intensity storms blowing them out to sea where they never would be. Um, so that's a, a, a potential problem. And this is the only dragonfly species that's confirmed to migrate at night. The other species of dragonflies that we know are migratory all do it during the daytime. And this species, again, a really cool name, the variegated meadowhawk. Look how gorgeous this is. I know I'm, I'm geeking out about the beauty of dragonflies, but, you know, butterflies hog up all the attention for beautiful insects. Um, many, many, many insect species also have just fabulously beautiful colors and, and patterns on them. So I encourage you to sort of look at the micro wildlife and try to appreciate it more. And photos are a great way to do that. That's why I really, I did a lot of research to find really beautiful photos for everybody here. But this is probably the, the least well-known um, migratory behavior for a dragonfly. But this is a Western species. It does migrate up and down the Pacific coast. Um, from Washington down to California, but you know it's a species that a lot more research is needed. And I think that's an important note because while we do know a lot about the natural world and we do know a lot about a lot of different species of wildlife, so much yet is unknown. And that's a little bit scary to think about um, you know, how much we don't know, including what the population statuses are of so many of our wildlife species, even here in the US. So it just underscores the need to you know, make sure we're thinking about conservation. Um, migration threats. So pesticides. Dragonflies are insects. So you, know, you spray pesticides, including those mosquito sprays that you can hire companies to spray all over your yard. That, those are broad spectrum insecticides. They're going to kill not only mosquitoes, but they're going to kill bees. They're going to kill butterflies. They're going to kill uh, animals like the dragonfly, um, despite what the marketing materials will tell you from those companies. So that's a real problem. Uh, climate change. I hate to keep coming back to it, but it's the reality. The extreme winds, the droughts that are drying up some of these seasonal wetlands, um, some mismatches between migration where animals might migrate earlier or later than when their, their food resources or their breeding habitats there. These are all issues that are facing dragonfly migration. All right, my last group of animals that engage in migration or maybe in this case, seasonal movement is a, is a better way of describing it are snakes. I mean, who would have thought that snakes could be counted among migratory wildlife? So, um, and apologies to anybody that is freaked out by snakes. Um, you're gonna be seeing a bunch of snake pictures. I encourage you to take your deep breath. Almost all snake species in North America are 100% harmless to people. I'm gonna repeat that. Almost all snake species in North America are 100% harmless to people. And this is a fact, all snake species, even those few venomous species that could pose a little bit of threat to us are more afraid of us than we are of them. And I know you might find that hard to believe if you have a snake phobia. These are not animals that feed on humans. We are much bigger than them. They view us as predators. They do everything in their power to avoid us, whether it's from camouflage or hiding or fast movements to get away from us, or in some cases rattling in order to say, hey, I'm here, leave me alone, I'm terrified of you. So try to keep that perspective if you see snakes. So 
Anyway, back to snake migration. Um, this is the Eastern mud snake, really beautiful, beautiful example of a snake. Um, why do snakes migrate? So they're migrating, again, not super long distances because they lack wings and of course they lack legs to be able to cover massive distances. So as I mentioned, their migrations are much, you know, sort of shorter, uh, you know, shorter distances, right? And so why might a snake migrate? Well, Again, they're ectothermic or cold-blooded. So snakes that live in northern areas, they need to hibernate. They need to go underground and get away from the that really, really cold temperature. So some snake species are just migrating to their winter hibernacula. Um, other snakes are migrating for reproductive purposes, you know, to find mates. And in some of the snakes engage in these sort of um, kind of group mating events, um, you know, and so... <laughs> Um, they might be moving for that. And then other snakes are moving across the landscape at different times of the year following food resources. So I'm going to talk about uh, some examples of those, those three different examples of or, or, or reasons for migrating. So one of the most famous snake migrations happens here in the Shawnee National Forest, um, which is in, in Illinois, um, in the LaRue Pine Hills Research natural area. So this area actually has something called the snake road, um, which I think I've never seen this. It's one of my, it's on my list of sort of ecotourism, uh, you know, bucket lists to actually go and witness this for myself. But every year, twice a year in the spring between March 15th and May 15th, and then in the fall between September 1st and October 30th, there are there's a movement of snakes and, and actually a lot of other wildlife that crosses this particular road, um, again, which is how it got called the snake road. And so what many of the snake species here are doing is moving across the landscape from their summer habitat, which is the LaRue swamp, which for many snake species is their, their perfect habitat, you know, lots of uh, you know, you know, moist environments, lots of small animals to eat, you know, rodents, frogs, insects, all that kind of thing. But that doesn't offer hibernation. And again, it can get pretty cold in Illinois. That the, the swamps don't really offer very good underground places where they can get away from that cold temperature. So what they need to do is get over to the limestone bluffs that are also found in this region, but, you know, they're more upland environments. So when they do that, you know, we humans, of course, put a road in their path. Um, and so, you know, they have to cross this this road now in order to go from their their summer foraging grounds to their winter hibernation grounds. Now, I'm happy to report that we have gotten our act together and this road is actually closed during those migration times. Um, at any time, anybody throws a little bit of love towards some animals that might be considered unlovable. And I think snakes are probably at the top of that list. I think that's a good thing. So this, I find... You know, this this sort of gives me life when I think about wildlife conservation efforts and the fact that, you know, people care enough to 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 do this and to shut this road down. And obviously it's not like a major highway. So that probably contributes to the to the decision that, you know, we can get away with closing it. But um, but at any rate, they do close it. And it's estimated that up to 25 percent of snakes in the U.S. end up as roadkill. So that's a lot. So doing this is, a, is actually a really special thing. So. There are up to two dozen snake species in that ecosystem that are um, that are engaging in this seasonal movement, um, including some venomous species like the copperhead and the cottonmouth, but some other you know totally harmless species like the milk snake, the ring snake, and the ribbon snake. So I just wanted to show a couple of the different species. So that's seasonal movement for hibernation purposes. Another example of snake movement is happening at the Narcissus snake dens. Um, and this is up in Manitoba, Manitoba, up in Canada. And the what's happening here is that a species of snake called the red-sided garter snake are moving to these hibernacula where they hibernate en masse. And then in the spring, they emerge. And since they're all there, they might as well take advantage of it for mating. So there are these mass mating balls of snakes. Um, again, Apologies if you're traumatized by snakes, because now I've just not only shown you snakes, but I've shown you a writhing mass of them. But these snakes are just doing what every species has to do. They have to reproduce. Um, and so there's these awesome mating balls that, that you can observe. Really, really fascinating stuff. Um, I'm winding down here because I know we're almost out of time. Um, another, the last reason that snakes might migrate is to move to areas where food sources are available seasonally. So we talked about how bats 
um, some bat species are moving north from Mexico and Central America up into the southern U.S. And um, in those warm months, they become available to things that like to eat bats. And many snakes, snake species do like to eat bats. They're a great little, um, you know, warm blooded mammalian prey for them, just like they might feed on rodents that are crawling around on the ground. And so species like coach whips, which is what you see here, Texas rat snakes and um, Great Plains rat snakes um, have been you know, they've evolved, they figured out that there are these food sources at these roosting caves for bats. And so they move to those caves during the season when the bats are present. And so here's an example of what they do. They will climb up into the rocks around the entrance of these caves. And all they have to do is wait for dusk or dawn when, you know, so many of these bats, and I showed you the pictures before, how many bats there are, it's pretty easy for them to just strike out and pluck about out of the air right off of the wing and then they get a nice meal. So I'm gonna leave you with a slightly disturbing photo, but also really cool. This is a Western rat snake devouring a poor unfortunate bat. Um, you know, snakes need love too, bats need love too, but they're, you know, everybody's part of an ecosystem. And so, um, you know, hopefully despite the photo here, you enjoyed this talk. I'm, I'm wrapping up now. So make sure you get those questions over into the chat. Um, Chris is going to read them out to me. But um, yeah, hopefully you learned something about some unconventional migratory wildlife today. And hopefully, again, you'll be inspired to get involved in conservation efforts, whether you know you want to support the work of the National Wildlife Federation at the national level or more on the local level. Our North Carolina affiliate, North Carolina Wildlife Federation is there. And of course, um, you know, everybody um, who's hosting this, all of the different organizations are great places and, and organizations and institutions to get involved in and support for learning, but also for the conservation work that they're doing. So fire away on your questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. What do you got for me, Chris? Uh, well, well, the first thing I'm gonna say is fantastic job. That Thank was you. fabulous. Uh, and I would encourage everyone who's watching to drop their appreciations in the chat. Just clapping hands emojis all the way down, everybody. Uh, really cool stuff. I did not know about some of these things. Like, I'd never heard of Snake Road. That's on my list now, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it, I, I mentioned this is only the second time I've given this talk. So mm -hmm. um, I didn't honestly myself know that much about Snake Road. And so when I was first asked to develop a talk on wildlife migrations for National Wildlife Federation donors, I was like, I got to I'm not doing it on birds and butterflies. Right. I'm going to do it on some of these other things that nobody knows about. And it was the perfect opportunity to dive in and learn a little bit more about it myself. Um, I didn't know a lot of those facts until I did the research for this. And, you know, I encourage everybody to do that. Right. I mean, everybody can be a naturalist. I don't you don't go to school and get a degree in naturalist. Right. A naturalist is just somebody who loves nature and wants to learn about it. And in my opinion, is somebody that can then communicate about it and help other people understand. But everybody can do this. Google is powerful. Go to your library. You know, so many great resources that are out there today that are just, you know, a few clicks away or a short trip, you know, pull out a book and, um, you know, tons of great on, you know, videos and online content. And of course, sessions like this too. Exactly right. Okay. So one of the first questions that came in for you is from Audrey, uh, who's curious about uh, a type of animal movement that we're seeing now with climate change, which is range expansions. I know vampire bats have a heat limited range. Do you know how that range is being affected by climate change? Great, great question and observation. I do not know the answer to that um, in terms of, of vampire bats, but there's a research opportunity. Um, I guarantee you, if you do a little bit of Googling, you'll, you're going to find some information about that. But what I can say is that, yeah, I mean, climate change is, is pretty radically and rapidly changing, you know, sort of the earth as a whole, you know, the average, you know, global temperatures are rising. And of course, that doesn't mean that that everywhere is going to be hotter. It means that it's it's disrupting our stable weather patterns that we've had for you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And that is causing all sorts of um, impact to plant communities and and um, weather patterns and things like that. And that, of course, affects wildlife. So, you know, we have seen examples of some species able to meet that rapid change and rapid change. You know, I'm not talking about, you know, over the course of a few years. Right. Like th these changes happen naturally over the course of, again, 
you know, thousands or millions of years, right? And we're, because of climate change, making them happen in the space of decades, right? And so animals of many species and plants too are just not able to move or adapt. And so that's the big problem. So I don't know what the answer is for vampire bats. Um, there are three species of those for anybody that doesn't know. Um, they generally don't feed on humans. Um, they're mostly feeding on birds or mammals, um, you know, oftentimes livestock, really, really cool animals. Um, I have a whole talk that I give on bats that I usually do in October for Halloween, where I talk a lot more about them. And actually, your question has inspired me to to do a little bit of research myself and maybe talk about that when I'm talking about the vampire bats. So thanks. Awesome stuff. All right. Ed wants to know... Uh when you were talking about the bats that will feed on the hummingbird feeders. So should folks who have nectar feeding bats in their area, leave hummingbird feeders out overnight? Yeah. I mean, you know, just with caution that I always give with feeders, you know, remember feeders aren't habitat. They're not a replacement for the natural plants that are feeding these bats or the hummingbirds or the bees or the butterflies. So, you know, you want to make sure you protect natural areas, plant native plants. You know, in the case of those those bats I mentioned, they're feeding on uh, things like saguaro cactus and they're feeding on agave. These are huge plants when they're mature. So maybe not necessarily something you would have in your landscape. But yeah, if you're watching and you live in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Southern California, and you have those plants, uh, or if you don't have those plants, considering adding them um, into your garden, into your landscape, and that's the best way to feed them. But yeah, I mean, leave the the, the feeder out at night and maybe throw a little camera on it. Um, you might just get visited by one of these bats, which would be pretty awesome. Oh, yeah, that would be fun to catch on the camera. Yeah. All right. Uh, Bill's curious about dragonflies. How long do they live? Well, I mean, again, it's going to vary from species to species. Um, and so but most insects don't live very long. Um, you have to remember that dragonflies have this life cycle, not unlike, um, you know, got a butterfly in that, you know, most people I think know that you know, butterflies, they're, they're an egg, they hatch into a caterpillar, the caterpillar grows, they pupate, and then they become butterflies. Well, dragonflies um, go through a similar process in that, you know, they hatch into this aquatic larval phase, they spend a duration of time in the water. Again, it's going to vary from species to species. Some might be, you know, quickly, uh, quickly reach metamorphosis, where they emerge as the winged adult, some might last longer. Um, so I don't know exactly, you know, the exact length of time that any given dragonfly species will live. But again, once they emerge as that winged adult, which is what we think of, you know, with with we think of only the adult phase usually. And oftentimes those lifespans can be as little as a couple of weeks for, for insects. Um, so, um, you know, again, another great research question. I, green darner is probably the one to look up because again, there's probably the most data available about how long they'll actually live in that adult phase, but it's an entirely different question. Their entire lifespan from hatching to the, you know, the end of that adult phase. One of my favorite things you talked about was uh, how, the the multi-generational migrations that happen because uh folks i feel like are fairly familiar with it with monarchs yeah they do the multi-generational migration thing except for the one generation that goes all the way back south but to see uh, the way that wildlife track climate patterns throughout the year even if it means generation after generation i don't know that like the seeing the chart of the movement throughout the year north and south uh, i thought was just so impressive yeah, and again, it's not very well understood um, how animals are necessarily doing this. It really varies. And I mentioned some of the different ways that bats are migrating. Um, you know, they are able to, um, you know, some wildlife can, again, perceive the Earth's magnetic field, which we really can't. So it's kind of a bizarre thing to even think about. It's like, describe a color you can't see, you know? We just, we're, we're not that special in the grand scheme of things. We don't have some of the abilities that a lot of other species have. Um, and so there, there's that. And, um, and, you know, it's, you know, like, what is, what is instinct, right? Like, how do you, like, instinct is innate behavior, but like how it forms and how it starts sometimes can be hard to kind of pin down. Um, and so the best we can do is say, this is like, you know, it's not a learned behavior, it's an innate behavior, but I agree with you, Chris, like the idea that this happens over multiple generations, like this animal has never done this. It's never seen this place yet. It knows how to get there. Um, and so it is incredibly, incredibly fascinating. 
Um, and again, not just for the dragonflies or the bats, you know, for birds too, and you know the my, the monarchs and everything. So, um, you know, it's an area I've, I've said it a bunch of times in this talk. We we need more research into. And so, if anybody is out out there as a as a budding scientist, you know, maybe this is going to be your PhD project and help us learn what's going on with these things. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and then they should get in touch with me here at the museum so that they can come give a talk. And we can all learn about it. There you go. There you go. <laughs> David, thank you so much. This has been just amazing. Well, again, thrilled to be here. Love, um, you know, getting to work with you guys. It's always a treat. And again, maybe next time I'll make it down to North Carolina. <laughs> I, I think so. We need to, we'll get working on that one so we can put you back on stage in the big theater. Yeah, I'd love that. <laughs> so much fun. Uh, to all the viewers, hey, thanks for tuning in today. Thanks for being with us for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Guess what? We'll be back here again next Wednesday at noon with another great presentation. You can get information on that at the museum's website, naturalsciences.org. You can also follow the Office of Environmental Education on social media to get updates. They're at North Carolina EE on Facebook and Twitter. And then, of course, you can sign up for the Lunchtime Discovery Series email newsletter. The link to do that is over there in the chat. You can click through get signed up. That way you've got the link to this YouTube video in your inbox. You can come and join us anytime. Uh, David, before we close, if folks want to follow the work of NWF and what you're up to, how can they do that? Well, for National Wildlife Federation, just go to nwf.org. Um, we're also all over social media, um, pretty much every social media platform we're on. Same thing with me. Um, I'm on most places, naturalist David Mizajewski, which I've set myself up for making it really difficult to find me because of my using my full name and all that. But I'm usually, uh, if you search for that, if you search on my name, there's not that many of us. So that's a, a, a great way to keep in touch with me. I love interacting with folks on social, ask questions. I'll do my best to answer. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's a, uh, the best place to find me. Great stuff. In the chat, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation wrote, thank you, Dave and NCMS for helping to spread the wonder wisdom and the word about wildlife movement and the importance of habitat connectivity so wildlife can survive and thrive. Thanks Excellent. for being in there, NCWF. Yeah. All right, everybody. Be kind, be well. We'll see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>